Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am Lucy Shea. I'm the group CEO of Futera. Uh, and I want to welcome you to Solutions House, where we have a motto, and the motto is answers only. Now, I, I'm going to suggest that as it's not a complete rule, it's a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and as entrepreneurs, as we were saying earlier, Santiago, we at least want to have some of the answers, yes. right? <laughs> Correct. Hopefully. Hopefully. So it's a reminder that we're in 2022. And it's not that we can't look at the problems, but if I could suggest we look at the problems just long enough to invent the solutions to them. That's the space we need to be in now. Um, now, usually, this lovely space is our Futera New York office, and I want to thank all the Futera team for moving themselves out this week and um, gifting it over to Solutions House, so I'm enormously grateful for that, thank you. Uh, this this um, gathering has been a partnership uh, with Futera, Google, and the Exponential Roadmap um, in order to... Um, you know, look at the solutions and actually gathering everyone together has been a really inspiring journey in itself. We hadn't quite realised just how many, you know, solutionists we had in our joint ecosystem. So it's been a wonderful thing um, to put together. Now, a few housekeeping points. There is no fire alarm expected. So if it goes off, please do not use the elevators that go to the stairs. The exit is here. Um, and um, we've got two bathrooms towards the back there, on the left, uh, one is accessible. And please be kind to yourselves, don't feel the need for, you know, uh, insane bladder control. If you need the loo, you can just go, <laughs> as we're all talking, that's, that's all totally fine. Um, there is Wi-Fi, uh, there's a bit of 2G and 5G you can choose from. And the uh, Look for Solutions House and the, uh, the key is Answers Only, of course. <laughs> capital A, capital O. Now, um, this session is focused on Meet the Solutionists, the folks who are actually um, putting the climate solutions into practice. Because that in 2022, that is what our world needs now. And, as an entrepreneur myself, uh, as a female entrepreneur, I can certainly say I've really seen the value in folks who have the idea of what needs to change, see the solution, work on fixing it, um, and not just have the idea, but you know, roll up the sleeves and get it done. So that's going to be. Um, uh, and, and there is so much in the story of entrepreneurship as well, which I really hope we can pull out. Um, in this panel. So I am so honoured um, to be joined by this fantastic panel um, that we have here. So I will uh, briefly introduce you, um, but then as I come to you uh, with the first question, please do feel free to um, say a few words more about you and what you do, or even demonstrate some of the solutions that we have here. Spoiler, there may be some demonstrations going on. Uh, okay, so first of all, um, Eski. Eski Marcinas is uh, with AB InBev. Um, delighted to say there will be some AB InBev uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beer, so later. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, Eski is the Chief Sustainability Officer at AB InBev. And um, what I love is how your focus is on um, sustainability solutions, but also inclusive growth. So we'd love to draw a little bit out of mm -hmm. that um, as we get going. Um, okay, then next to Eski, we have Santiago Espinosa de, de los Monteros Jalisburu, and you are the CEO of Toronto. Um, one of our, our entrepreneurs and um, solutionists um, in action, and so Santiago will tell us all about Toronto and the journey um, that he's been on. Uh, then, next to Santiago, we have Gwenel Avisui, and Gwenel's with Schneider Electric, um, and she's uh, our, the Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer and a member of the Executive Committee. So we can't wait to hear about both Schneider's approach, but also um, uh, the work on um, building out entrepreneurship in the wider ecosystem. And here, finally, last but by no means least, 
we have Sharon Barrack, who is the CTO and co-founder of Saluta. Okay, we will go in that story that I mentioned earlier of entrepreneurship. Um, there's so much there. There's the commerce, there's the value, there's the growth. There's also the personal growth, the journey that people go on, um, the love that pours into the business, um, so the passion and the drive. So I hope, I mean, who knows what's going to come out of the panel? We don't know yet, um, but I hope that we will go on um, an arc where we look at the necessity for entrepreneurship in tackling climate solutions. Uh, the ecosystem, if you like, what, where we see large corporates leaning in to build that entrepreneurial uh, network. Um, we'll look at some of the learnings uh, that our panel have had along the way, um, very much around you know, how to take breakthrough ideas to scale, a little moment on some of the barriers, but enough, only enough to look at the solutions. Um, and we will finish, if we may, with a little bit of advice, philosophy, um, to us, uh, also to, uh, you know, not, not younger, but former selves, if we say. So we'll, we'll finish with a kind of uh, very personal uh, moment there. Uh, all within uh, an hour or under. Um, and just thank you, everyone, for being here. We feel um, so honoured and delighted to see you all here. So, SK, I'm going to sit down, relax a little bit. And um, start with you. And um, as I say, if you want to uh, talk a little bit, of, uh, if, if you would, um, briefly about uh, your role, but also um, if you can take us straight into where you can see the, the necessity for entrepreneurship in climate solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me here today. And thank you all for making the the, the trek down here uh, from Midtown. I'm sure you guys are all over uh, the city this week, and as we all are, and I uh, really appreciate you coming here this afternoon. Um, I really believe that the world needs more reasons to believe. Uh, so, you know, Solutions House, the, the concept of it was so appealing for us that, you know, it could be a nice forum for all of us to get together and really look into the solutions that are out there and, and find the reasons to believe. Um, but so, so thank you for that. So um, at ABI, I head up the sustainability team. And uh, for those of you that may not uh, know AB InBev, we are uh, the world's local brewer with operations across nearly 50 countries around the world. We've got a portfolio of over 400 iconic brands, um, and, and many of them represent um, you know, the, the cultural heritage and, and the local communities within which uh, we've, we've grown and, and nourished these brands. And um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work uh, for a company um, that really, truly understands sustainability and why we do what we do and uh, with an incredibly uh, diverse and, and small but mighty team, some of whom are in the audience today, who work day in and day out uh, to, to bring our sustainability vision to life. Uh, but for us at ABI, you know, that starts all the way upstream uh, from that smallholder farmer and how we think of agricultural development to how we think of brewing, you know, efficiency, resource management inside our own operations, packaging, logistics, cooling, all the way to you know, the small retailers, nearly six million uh, mom and pop shops that sell our products around the world. Uh, so an entire value chain approach uh, goes into how we envision uh, sustainability and share prosperity for the communities. Of course, climate action and climate transition is a big piece of that. Uh, we do see the far reaching implications of climate change in our, in our operations uh, and we understand it and, and I think um, you know, I think it's fair to say that we are fortunate to be that close, to have boots on the ground, to be that close to that smallholder farmer, uh, to have that daily touch with that small retailer so that we can help them, uh, you know, transition. We can help build their climate resilience as well and help them uh, switch to renewable sources too. So in that process, uh, when we were setting our, our current set of public commitments, our 2025 sustainability goals, we asked ourselves something really tough. We said, you know, how sure are we that we're going to hit these goals by 2025? And, and, and the commitments range from climate uh, to packaging, agriculture, and water. And, um, you know, the, the, the brutally honest answer was, okay, maybe we know 85, 90% of the way how to get there with the current technologies, the partnerships, the supply chains, that, that you know, the current operating model. Um, but the remaining 10, 15%, we don't have an answer for, and we have to go find new solutions, and we have to go find new innovative partners, 
and uh, change our mindset. And and you know, I was at another session earlier today where we talked about how um, more so than technologies, we need to change mindsets and business models, right. right? So if we continue to rely on our current supply chains, current partners, we will not uh, build that future-proof business. So out of that came the 100 Plus Accelerator program, and I'm very honored to be here today with two of the, uh, the founders of two of the startups uh, with us, and some of our corporate partners as well, and from uh, Colgate Paul Malov is here. Um, so yeah, so you know we are really on the ground across nearly 50 countries around the world trying to find solutions every day, and, and we ask ourselves the tough questions. I am not one that shies away from the questions, and I can get more into the philosophy of all that, and how I'm fundamentally an engineer and I like to tinker with things all the time. So, uh, nice. but yes, that's a long intro. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. What I yeah. love about that is um, we had the launch earlier today here of the um, Exponential Roadmaps um, 1.5 degree uh, playbook for business. Um, and um, what came out of that um, really strongly was that sure, there are, as you were there, there are barriers uh, to get into sustainability, but it's such a source of entrepreneurial um, and commercial uh, opportunity. So I love that you took us on that journey yeah. already. Um, now, I've got one more question for you, if I may. Not the one yet on um, kind of the philosophy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to close with that, if I may. Um, but before we go to one of the um, 100 plus accelerator um, participants, Sharon, that, that will be you. Eski, if you could just um, build out a little bit uh, from the accelerator and actually what advice, what you've learned, mm -hmm. so before we come actually go to some of the entrepreneurs, and Gwinnell will go to you as well obviously, what, what, have you got any advice for others at corporates who are thinking about doing a similar type of program? Yeah, absolutely. And I can't take credit for this. I've got two fantastic team members. One of them is here, Car uh, Caro Garcia, who's one of the co-founders of the program. Maisie Devine is the other one who's out on mat leave. Um, you know, they, de they designed the initiative. and. Honestly, what we were doing when we created the program was not just another corporate accelerator where you write a check and you outsource the mentorship and management of it and you say, okay, good luck. Now you're part of our community or ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, but they really don't exist in their value chain. What we really wanted to do was create a program that goes out there. We issue challenges to the world. For, first of all, we go deep into the business, talk to an energy and fluids director, talk, talk to an economist, talk to a packaging innovation specialist. We identify what are the solutions they're still looking for that they can't find in our current supply chain. And then we issue those challenges to the world. And then out of that comes hundreds of applications. And in some years, it's been thousands of applications that come through. And then we put them through a very rigorous interview process, not just with the sustainability team, but with the business teams that are actually going to mentor, pilot, and, and take ownership of that, of that project, that initiative. Um, and, and that's how we, we grow the programs. And that was a, a really great learning because there aren't ma that many initiatives out there right now that are going to bring in these solutions and put them in their operations or in their value chain and test them for six to eight months before they decide, OK, how do I commercialize this? How do I uh, grow this partnership or expand the contract? Uh, so that, for us, was a huge learning that we went that deep into the business to pull out the challenges and then we go and we source them externally because um, that opens so many new conversations, so many new doors. And I think one piece that I was actually pushing the team, I was pushing the team to be very focused and put mm -hmm. as few challenges out there as possible and mm -hmm. see what works. And um, you know, their, their um, theory, and, and they were right at the end, was that why not? create a record in the world of the types of solutions we're looking for, a company like AB InBev is looking for, and year after year, a founder or a solutionist, mm. you know, a startup can look at those and it can help shape the way they think of their product, the, right. the way they think of their next evolution of, of, of their uh, solution. So for me, that was a big learning. You know, how do you issue these challenges out there that you may not find an answer for year after year, but at least they're in the public domain because now you're actually putting signals into the market, yeah. into the academic community, into the research and technology communities where they can look to see, okay, these are the big challenges companies are looking to, to identify solutions for. We've got a lot of nods yeah. from our fellow panelists on this. I think you've really uh, touched on point there. And we talk here about the need to create the structure for change, but also the story. And I think that's really leaning into both of those. Okay. Sharon, over to you. Um, so uh, I, I did want to ask you, as you know, obviously um, 
uh, you've responded to one of these uh, challenges, um, but I wanted to, you to come take us back a little bit further, if you would, and um, what as the co-founder of Salutum, what drove your need to start the business, but also tell us a little bit about Salutum itself and what it's set up to do. <laughs> okay. And you can show us, I think, should you wish, uh, what Salutum does. I'd be happy to. So, um, in fact, my background, I'm a chemical engineer, and I used to work for a plastic company. I was the R&D manager at plastic company, and it was over there I was exposed uh, and understood two things. First, we are living on plastic. Mm -hmm. well, it's kind of the plastic area these days, right? When you ask people, what is the challenge today? And what is, it's all about plastic. Mm -hmm. um, and second, as the plastic is the second biggest problem we're facing today, only second to, well, climate change, which both of them, I guess, are kind of related. So about five years ago, I decided um, I couldn't deal with it anymore, and I actually quit. And I wanted to find a solution to the plastic waste Amazing. problem. Uh, so yeah, coming from the industry, saw the, the good and the bad, and wanted to, to fix it. And what actually Saludum is all about is, so the vision is to, the vision is to um, have a, a solution for the plastic waste. The, w the way we are doing it is, Actually, we have a compound, we have a material, a product that feels and looks like plastic because we want to have the same benefits of plastic that everyone knows. But when we saw the plastic islands in the ocean, we understood those kinds of issues that we are facing. This material actually, when it comes in contact with water, will dissolve and then fully biodegrade. And do you want to see it? I do. Yay. I do. It is so fantastic sounding. We've got to see it. Yeah. So... What we have done is actually, we have products that are very sensitive to water, which I'm going to demonstrate, and we have products that are much less sensitive to water, because obviously when you want, you want to go outside and it's a rainy day, you don't want your bag to dissolve. But I'm going to start with a quick one. Let me stand up for this piece, so oh. the folks at the back can see as well. Happily. Thank you. And so, tell me if I need to pass you any water. I just need a glass of water, that's yeah. all I need. Okay, here we go. Regular tap water. <sighs> Hope you can see it back then. So this, you can touch it, right? It's like, uh, yeah, it's like film. Plastic yeah, film. it's like plastic yeah. film. So I'm going to put it here. Those are a bit cold water, but it's okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm used we to like this uh, moment when it takes a bit time. We have some warmer water at the back. Yeah, it? No, it's okay. Here it's already start, And you can see how it starts already to dissolve. And I will put it here. And by the end of the panel, nothing will remain in the water. That is, I mean, that is a round of applause, I feel. Thank you. Um, I, I did see online that it's safe to drink. Am I okay to mix it back in with the water, or should I give it separate? Just you can drink it, I can drink it. I, I drink it several times, it's not toxic. This wow. is what we are testing. We're testing, uh, we are going to have a water certification for water biodegradation, because we passed the ISO test. So it's, 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 it's safe. safe. To drink. Yeah. Fantastic, all right. Okay, thank you. So we've had our first demonstration of solutions house. Thank you, Sharon, for that. Mm. Um, now, um, Santiago, I'm going to go to you, and then um, Gwen Al, I'm going to come uh, over to you. So, uh, Santiago, if we could um, uh, build out a little bit more, again, obviously the theme of entrepreneurship, um, that's what, mainly what we're talking about, but I'd love to hear from you um, a, a little bit about Toroto uh, and your role and um, stretching from the issues of plastic but to nature-based solutions, what the role of entrepreneurship or the need for entrepreneurship is, is there, if you could give us that perspective. Of course, thanks a lot for the question. Also, thanks a lot for the invitation to this magnificent event. Uh, it's really an honor for us to come from where we come from and be here with you all, uh, with these panelists, explaining a little bit of what we do. Uh, we started working because we realized to fight the climate crisis in a meaningful manner, we need the Earth's help. And for us to get it, we need Earth to be either restored or conserved or sustainably managed. But the main tendency for most available land is degradation. Now, to do this, we have a huge supply chain problem. For example, take the example of regenerative agriculture. And huge companies such as ABI pretty much understanding that regenerative agriculture is the way to go to solve the problems re related to one of their largest sources of emissions. Mm -hmm. To do regenerative agriculture, you need biofertilizer. 
and even the amount of biofertilizer that you need to do uh, 500 hectares is just not an amount of product that you can find at the field level. If you want to restore a thousand hectares, you need to be able to produce 1.5 million trees every year. Just the tons of seeds that you need to gather yeah. to be able to do that, that's just not happening right now anywhere in the world in the scale at which we need it. So this brought us to start Toroto. The reason we thought as entrepreneurs we could give something to this equation was these supply chain issues and these field level capacity issues need to be solved. Unfortunately, the kind of entrepreneurship we're seeing in the 21st century is not very compatible with what needs to be done uh, to face the climate crisis. For example, there's no way we can use technology to restore more hectares faster. We still need seeds, we still need trees, we still need soil to go through very slow processes for it to happen, we still need rain. Uh, so as we go to VCs, of course, they run in the other direction of what we have to offer. We need patient entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We need nature-minded entrepreneurs who are building businesses to last at least 100 years, which is what we need them to last for their solutions to become as permanent as we need them to be. So I would say the relationship between entrepreneurship and yeah. facing the climate crisis through NBSs yeah. is super important. It's just a more patient kind of entrepreneurship that we need. Oh, that's great. I love that we're starting to explore um, the different styles of entrepreneurship. Uh, now, before I move over to Gwinnell, just tell me, um, uh, just expand if you would a little bit around what you hope to achieve with Toroto. And its of aims. course. So Toroto, uh, we basically started doing a lot of this heavy lifting, this field level heavy lifting uh, that needs to happen for climate action to be scalable. We are now a 50-person team uh, tending to around half a million hectares of project area. This is a very small country. What we are uh, aiming to achieve is 5 million hectares under management by 2025 and 20 million by 2030, which is a mid-sized country, like half of France, something like that. Uh, and in, inside that area, there needs to be a complete stop of degradation and uh, a regenerative attitude towards recovering the forest that has been lost. I thought this awesome. It's round applause. That is um, fantastic. Um, fantastic aims, and so fan and great to see that you are on the way to actually meeting those as well. Okay. So now let's. Um, we're going to kind of zoom out again for a moment, Gwenelle, and. Um, uh, now, I, I don't know if we're going to have a, an engineering theme coming through here again, but I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't want to game this. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit around um, you and Schneider Electric and particularly your innovation at the EDGE program and why you started it? Yes, thank you very much. So um, I would like to talk a little bit about energy. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Because today it represents more than 80% of the emissions worldwide. So energy is a big problem. For many companies, you know, when you look at the emissions, energy is you know, the biggest place where you have the biggest emissions. So we need to tackle the question about energy. And I've been working in the utility sector uh, before, where you know, we used to say that we need to produce energy. So very much about the production side. Mm -hmm. In reality, I moved company, I joined Schneider Electric a year and a half ago, and here we're talking about how to reduce consumption of energy. Mm -hmm. So it's another way, another angle to look at energy in a way to better, better perform, meaning reducing consumption on energy. And this is a change of paradigm, because at the end of the day, it's looking at our own behaviors, being an industrial or residential or private person, but looking at our behaviors and looking at how are the ways in order to reduce your own consumption. And uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship, when, uh, you know, Schneider Electric is a big company, 130,000 employees across the world. So maybe sometime we may think at a big company, it's very difficult to innovate. And I think that we should not oppose innovation on large companies in many ways. It depends on where we, we embrace, embrace innovation. And for our companies, we decided to go on both sides of the equation, meaning developing innovation internally. And we want our people to think sustainability first. So that's why we needed to have a culture 
focused on innovation and sustainability so that we could drive innovation internally. Tomorrow, for example, we receive two awards for our products because it is a game changer in terms of innovation and sustainability. But I'm, when I'm talking with our people to develop our products, it took 10 years. In reality, 10 years by products to develop them and to be able to release them in the market. So it's a long way to go. And we used to say internally that when it comes to sustainability, it's like a marathon without a finish line. We always need yes. to reinvent ourselves. So basically, we're doing that internally on our core. And what's our core? It's everything related to electrification, everything related to software. Meaning we consider us as a tech company, hybrid company between software and hardware. And so it can work. Is it enough? And the second side of the equation is that it's not enough. We need to be very much connected to the external world because so many things are happening. When it comes to energy, the energy sector in the past was very centralized. We were looking for big, large plants. Now it's not the case anymore. It's not the case because you, because some other companies, they want to have their own energy on site. So it's much more decentralized. You want to manage your own energy. And therefore, you want to act in this system because you know that this is very impactful for climate. And so at the end of the day, well, this is a game changer. And for companies like ourselves, we need to be connected to this world. And that's how we build innovation at the edge in order to have this connection to the external world and to mitigate our bets because we are doing innovation internally, again, on the core, and we are able to take some bets. But at the end of the day, in this context, in environmental sector and in energy in particular, things are moving so rapidly, so rapidly. We need to tackle what's happening in the external world. And therefore, when it comes to energy, there is lots of things happening in distributed renewables, in distributed energy. And uh, well, we wanted to accompany some startups. We wanted to take partnerships. We wanted to take job ventures. We, we wanted to invest in some companies. And sometimes we have the question, what's the best recipe with uh, those companies? And there is no one single recipe in reality. It really depends on the level of maturity of uh, the startups. It really depends on what they require, what they need from big corporates to accompany them and to make them successful. And so our role is really to make them develop and to make sure that you know, we, have, we embrace everything that's going on externally. And uh, so in reality, in the past years, you know, we've built this fund, 500 million, and we wanted to have you know, weak signals. What's happening on the market in the energy sector, in the process automation? Have all those weak signals by having this partnership with the external world. And believe it yet, it's working. And now we have taken big bets in reality. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. So congratulations on the awards, um, just to pick up on that for a moment. Um, and I, 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 I really um, love how we're starting to hear, with entrepreneurialism running through as a theme, solutions, um, that are here and that are now, um, and in fact, uh, I'm just going to drop in when I heard Matt Damon speak last night, as I'm sure <laughs> many of you did. He gave a knockout talk, and he talked, I mean, so many wonderful things, but one of the things he said, which I think possibly we know within this room, but this message needs to get out more widely, is how the solutions are here, they are here right now. We just need to apply them all, but they're here right now. So it's fantastic to hear um, this range of solutions. Now, um, Eski, I'm, I'm going to come to you in a moment because I would love to build out this theme about um, uh, internal entrepreneurship, um, but just hold that thought, if you would, for a moment. Um, because, Gwenelle, can I just um, uh, pause and come back to you for a moment and say, um, obviously, so many of these solutions that we require um, to tackle climate do require mass electrification first in order to have low carbon cement or low carbon aluminium, whatever it may be. And I just wondered if you could expand, I mean, you, I, you, you told us some about this already, but could you expand just for a moment on the role of entrepreneurs um, in the wider ecosystem on particularly driving that mass electrification piece? So yes, it's a good question. So we see a lot of discussion right now on how to phase out from fossil fuel and how to electrify, and this is a, this is a big topic. And at the end of the day, we believe that this is a combination of electrification and digitization. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, in a building, without changing anything, an existing building, you, you can just 
uh, implement some connected products on the cloud with edge control and at the end of the day with artificial intelligence, you can manage the whole building and reduce the consumption of energy by 30%. So in reality, you know, you have different angles. Electrification on one side, sometimes it can take time, so you need to plan for it. But in addition to that, going towards digitization with some concrete software tools, it's another area. And where it matches with entrepreneurship, you know, the world of AI, the world of machine learning, it's unique and it's immense. How a company like Schneider Tech would know everything. We need to have use case, and therefore we need to connect with clients and to develop use case with them. And also with entrepreneurs who can think through with new innovation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So that's why we need this connection. And my belief is that our role as a company is not only that, it's also to make sure that you know, we can give a sense of the role of women in this environment. You know, in Schneider Electric, we are very much committed in order to have more women in STEM. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything related to science, technology, etc. But in reality, it's also the way we address entrepreneurs. We need to find a way to emerge new talents coming from the women uh, science and technology area in order to show that this connection is not only about technology, it's about breeding diversity and making you know, concrete cases on how we can be successful mm -hmm. uh, in, in this domain. So it's also a role that I want to advocate for. I'm a physicist, and I know that in all those companies, there are not so many, and we need role models. And we need in entrepreneurship to have this connection and to show that we are very uh, you know, unique in a way we address entrepreneurs in order to promote women in these sectors. Great, mm -hmm. fantastic, thank you. Um, Eski, I mean, you may want to build on that um, further, but yeah. if we could, the, the, um, where we were a moment ago around nurturing internal entrepreneurship, can you tell us how that works at ABM? Yeah, absolutely. And just building on, on, yeah. on that point as well, um, in our third cohort, about half of our um, startups were female founded, and we were really proud of that. And it was something we started tracking. It wasn't something we looked at in the first year. I mean, we were collecting the data, we just didn't. But even the fact that we were asking to these startups, do you have any um, you know, female team members? Uh, what portion of your founders are female? These are, again, putting signals into the market and really using um, kind of our voice and, and helping shape uh, the future as well uh, for, for innovation. Um, so it, you know, inside the company, I think for us you know, at ABI, we have a very strong culture around a, a sense of ownership, uh, very target-driven culture, um, and this relentless pursuit of results. You know, we're very focused on results, and we really roll up our sleeves. So it, it's not a company that pushes down decision-making or pushes down work. It's actually at the, at the highest levels you're rolling up your sleeves and you're, you're getting involved. And Because um, for you to be successful, you need to know the nuts and bolts of your business and really understand your entire value chain and, and, and your consumer, etc. Um, so, you know, for, for me, this comes down to how do I nurture a team that's going to continue to ask the tough questions to each other, to, to uh, their partners across the company, but also to me. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the piece that uh, in many cases we lose, right? We lose that ability to ask questions or raise our hand or voice an opinion. And the more we encourage our teams to do this, the more you create an open environment, the more creativity and innovation there is. So you actually can nurture an entrepreneurial spirit within the business if you create this team environment. And I know everyone talks about the psychological safety, but this goes beyond a psychologically safe environment to having an open, uh, inclusive discussion around what more can we do? What can we change? You know, if not me, who? And that's that's how we show up at work every day. And, and we ask some really tough questions. And, and and I am never satisfied with the answer of, we've always done it that way. That's not a good answer. It's like, okay, who said that that's how things are done? And how long ago was this? And give me a better answer. Um, so, you know, if you have that thirst for, um, for asking the questions. So we may not always have the right answers, and I don't claim that we do. We, we really don't, and, and that's why we need collaboration partnerships, and we look for innovation everywhere, everywhere, from the smallest to the biggest suppliers and partners that we work with. Um, but you have to... You have to know to ask the tough questions. Yeah, I mean, that culture piece is so important, isn't it? They would say culture eats strategy um, <laughs> for breakfast. So, um, uh, uh, but it takes time. I mean, culture is something that yeah. nurture over time. 
for us, it took 15 years in order to develop this culture of innovation and sustainability. Yeah. So just to say that it's not yeah. easy, but we need to invest, and it pays off at the end. And to build it in a generational exactly. way. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so um, Sharon, I'm going to come back to you, and um, I'd love to uh, tackle a new topic now, or kind of build on where we've been to um, scale and speed. So, so I feel we've, we've built the kind of the foundation, if you like, now in our conversation around how to um, support and create entrepreneurship. What's your view in terms of taking breakthroughs to scale? Uh, great, action, uh, great question. Um, I'm going to refer to what you say about Matt Damon because yeah. uh, I, I was <laughs> uh, I was fortunate enough to meet with him today and to actually hear it within his own words, which was. Very exciting, and uh, as as, uh, as he said, um, don't be afraid, right? Right? Don't be afraid to take actions, and I think that is the bottom line of what we are doing. So, I wasn't afraid to start a company about five years ago, and I'm not afraid of looking forward and how to scale. Mm -hmm. um, five years later, I have like great partners. I am fortunate enough, you know, to work with ABI, um, Colgate and more great partners. Amazon just said that they think that the product might be actually a solution. Oh, fantastic. So action to scale is actually now that we already scaled the technology is how we're going to scale now commercialization, which yeah. is obviously something we need to do. Yeah. And we're a startup based in Israel. Yeah. So I guess that the next challenge is as much as I'm a Zionist and I think we need to do things in Israel, I'm also looking at a sustainable way and we're going to scale it up outside of Israel yeah. to find production facilities right next to the clients because yeah. it's also economical and a sustainable way and this is how we are going to scale it now. That is great and um, wish you all the best um, in that journey and I couldn't agree more on the uh, don't be afraid. Um, now, um, Santiago, um, thinking about uh, the pipeline of entrepreneurship uh, and how we can build that, uh, what, what have you seen in your um, experience around uh, young people? And are, do you think we've got, uh, you know, that Gen Z are now all entrepreneurs? Are, you know, are we getting more young people drawn to entrepreneurship? Is that a little bit of a broad brushstroke or, you know, at, what, what, what do you see? Do you see young people building that pipeline and become and being more attracted to entrepreneurs to entrepreneurship? Well, more than a, we see that more than a conversation between entrepreneurship from a, as opposed to traditional way of business thinking. I think we need a merger of both, where we remove the easiness and the probably the too fast to bear pace of entrepreneurship, of traditional entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but we still need an entrepreneurial attitude inside mm -hmm. more uh, organized and defined structures. Mm -hmm. The reason I say we need a lot of uh, structure and a lot of organization is because most of these challenges arise from supply chain related issues, right? It's very difficult to talk about nature-based solutions without talking about the supply chains within which they exist or within which they should exist. So what I do see is uh, younger folks realizing that there needs to be an entrepreneurial attitude towards solving big company issues. And actually, I think the root of the, su of the success in, in what efforts have been successful inside companies such as, for example, AB InBev, have to do when they look for this entrepreneurial attitude to solve very old and boring issues, which are not boring and not old whatsoever, but <laughs> might lack this attractiveness to the 20-year-old eager mind. That's fab. I feel that, yeah, the, I love what you've done in putting that together with the new rule on only answers apply, where not if the answer is, that's how we've always done it. So <laughs> Of course. <laughs> that's, that's great. Okay, thank you. Now, um, well, um, we're gonna, this is my only question on barriers. So, I mean, panel, feel free if you do actually want to explore barriers a little bit more. But, uh, like Gwynel, more. you've got the barrier question. Um, what, uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it, it's, I'm sure there's no silver bullet here, but can you give us your view on, is there one big barrier to innovation that we must overcome? So I think the first uh, element is to make sure that we have the right spirit, in particular, mm -hmm. the right to fail 
because in innovation, it's never granted. As I mentioned before, uh, what we do in terms of innovation and R&D, you never know if it will work or not. When you invest for 10 years, you never know if it will work or not. So you need to make sure that you do not, you know, over, as, I mean, or assess in a way that you want to have, you know, profitability over an investment for innovation because you never know if it will be successful or not. But the right attitude would be to encourage the whole team to take risks. And in big organizations, that's not easy because we used to have short-term P&L. We look short-term, but in reality, big companies like Schneider Electric can do that because we had this spirit. We wanted to develop technology inside and outside, and therefore, we wanted to develop this spirit where there is a right to fail. So I think this is the first element. The second element is that what, everything should be deployed at scale, as you mentioned before. In reality, what's the barrier to develop at scale? It's that something, things are invisible. When it comes, for example, to software, this is not as visible as solar or wind. And when it comes to energy and decarbonization, well, people think about solar and wind. This is very sexy. In reality, there are plenty of other ways in order to decarbonize, mm -hmm. thanks to software, but it's to make visible what's invisible. And in reality, everybody today talking about how to remove fossil fuel are talking about how to develop more renewables, but this will take time. And in reality, there are plenty of other solutions that are available today. So again, it's adoption of existing solutions, and especially on software, because this is something that is not as material as solar and wind. So I think it's the, the adoption rate and making sure that at the end of the day, it's, uh, everybody feels concerned and there is no one single solution. It's a set of different solutions. And everybody feels as an agent, as an agent for uh, decarbonization. So I think this is the second element, scale it up through adoption and greater adoption. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Transparency and visibility gives you so much power because once you start seeing things, why you do what you do or what you need to be doing, you now start engaging people because you're taking something that's theoretical and making it a little bit more practical, a little bit more visible for people or taking something very academic and again, putting it in practice uh, and completely agree on the risk profile as well. You know, you need to have a certain level of risk profile. And again, this is something I'm also learning from my team. Of, of embracing innovation and change. And it doesn't come naturally to us. Um, and, and being comfortable with ambiguity, you know, we always hear people say this, but it's true. There are those of us that are more comfortable with ambiguity that will take that leap, like the founders that we see here, like the great work Schneider is doing. Um, and, and they explore new territories and maybe even prefer, you know, roads that have not been taken before. Um, and and I, think, I, I think this is something that if we continue to, to nurture that, uh, and not everyone will be like that, and that's okay, right? Um, but, but how you create that, that environment where you can pursue purposeful innovation uh, is really critical. And I really wanna highlight that. Innovation not for the sake of innovation, right? But in a very purposeful, deliberate way, yeah. Um, I, I, I would love to validate that um, even more in that, you know, we've been giving rounds of applause um, to our entrepreneurs, our, our innovators, and, and you deserve them. Um, but also for our, um, uh, Gwen and SK, as, uh, and I know you're representing huge teams and fantastic teams, but I, I, we really see that innovation in large businesses is not easy, uh, and you're point there about it taking you know up to a generation and your point there about building the culture I think is really cool if we're, if we're gonna for the large corporates to take something away from this really thinking through again the structure and story about how to create an innovative mindset because general corporates aren't set up for that they just they, they might there's a cycle of come product launches for example but they're not necessarily set up for that. So I really, I, I would love to, I, I think landing on that is, is, um, is, is a great finding um, mm -hmm. from this panel. So thank you all um, for um, coming up to that. Now, um, uh, I would love, um, Gwen, I'll just have a last question with you around policy makers, um, because we haven't, we haven't really touched on that so far. If others would like to come into that, please feel free. Um, but then I do want to save some time for the kind of personal advice bit at the end. Um, so, Gwynell, um, uh, you know, role of policy makers in supporting innovation, as I say, if others would like to build on it, do feel free. 
Well, good question again. So um, the, the role we see of policymakers is really to encouraging uh, new bets. And especially when it comes to new technologies, we need sometimes a framework uh, that would be a key enabler to accelerate this development or those deployment. What we see is that there is a huge dynamic right now in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, but also in Europe and in many other geographies. So the momentum is there. And at the end of the day, if we want to go faster, it's all about partnership. It's not just one company. It's not just the government. It's, not, it's everybody together, clients and NGOs and, 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 and governments in order to provide the right framework. So at the end of the day, yes, working with governments in order to explain what's the existing solution and what's not yet existing, what's invisible, but what needs to be supported in order to accelerate deployments. It's absolutely critical. Great. Um, so feel free to build on that if you would, uh, if you would like to, Eski. Well, I, I also, uh, when we started, uh, you were talking about uh, being an engineer and always wanting to tweak things. So is this, is this your kind of philosophy um, to uh, personal entrepreneurship or any advice you've got for us on kind of yeah. developing a I, I, I don't know if I can call myself an <laughs> entrepreneur, but um, I'm a naturally curious person. Yeah. It's just my nature. My husband knows it. My team knows it. Um, I ask a lot of questions. My kids are the same. They're seven and three. And I, I took the bus with my little one this morning to his school. And I kid you not, in a 20 minute bus ride, I think he asked me 40 questions. It was just, <laughs> and, and the woman sitting next to us was just looking at him amazed. I'm like, okay, it's, I, okay, it's my genes. I, I, I can't, I, you know. Um, but I think you have to be, yeah. So natural curiosity, I think, is something that I really lean into. And I, I, I have worked to use it in ways where it helps me with my critical thinking as well. Um, and, and um, yeah, just overall, I think, grounds me and helps me put things in context, and then I can figure out, okay, if this is a puzzle, then, then how do we solve it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just there's so much um, uh, learning developing, isn't there, around solutions? I almost feel like I need a book of uh, what we've all learned in creating um, these solutions and to take it to scale. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, Sharon, is there a piece of advice that you would uh, send back to yourself? I mean, I, I don't know if you need to. It sounds like you've built this thing amazingly. But is there is there anything that you would say to yourself when you started out that you wished you'd known then? Um, yeah, I think it's kind of related to what you say about barriers. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take a different angle of this, and this is what I would send. Uh, as you said, I think you know, being here, I don't regret anything, and I think things are happening as they should. But one advice, one thing I should have, should have known then is everyone is skeptical. When you're doing something, revolution, people will be skeptical. Like people ask me when we're like, like one person in the company, why you? I mean, really, there are these huge companies like plastic companies or energy companies or any. Why are you going to be the one who have the solution? And you need to really believe in yourself <laughs> at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, that you are going to have the answer. You're going to, you know, you're going to face failure. Obviously, you're going to face a lot of no's, but eventually, yes, you're going to come there, and eventually, you're going to raise money for the company and have employees, great employees. One of like the best thing in the company are my employees actually, um, working with great partners. Who would have thought, you know? Um, so to all of the skepticals out there, and basically yourself, because the most skeptical person is usually yourself. <laughs> so to me five years ago, thank God you weren't that skeptical. Thank God you told all the skepticals out there, yes, I am going to have the answer. We, are, we have innovation. And as you said, probably many big companies don't usually do so much innovation. And we, are th and we have the privilege to think outside of the box. Maybe this is it. <laughs> um, I think that piece around believing in yourself and you know working in change. You know, when do you ever get to hear the message? It's okay. What you're doing is enough. <laughs> it is all right. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and uh, Santiago, I mean, same question to you. And again, uh, you've clearly built this fantastic team, and you're scaling, and you're going places. Um, but so. Is there anything you would have liked to have known back then that you could send? I probably wouldn't give advice to a five-year-old, <laughs> if, if I'm honest. 
it still also feels, this question was, is probably the hardest to me because it still also feels very much day one to right. me when yeah. as I wake up and the team wakes up, it still feels like we have 98% uh, of, of the way to go. A piece of advice would be, uh, and I was thinking a lot about it as I, as I listened to the responses in the panel, the problems are not the sexy ones. If, mm. if the solutions were inside uh, uh, the sexy looking solutions, <laughs> uh, they wouldn't be the real problem. The problems tend to be hidden inside very complicated and technical issues alongside huge supply chains. And uh, again, closing off on the regenerative agriculture example, we all know it's important to do crop rotation and cover crops, but to do it in a way in which a global behemoth can actually consume the commodities produced on that land, that's the real trick and that's mm -hmm. a technical trick. Right. Um, that, the more I lean into that, the better results we used to get. Right. That is the hard work and the figuring it out and the building it from the ground up technical trick. Um, thank you. And uh, Gwenelle, um any advice you would give or any kind of philosophy you've developed on entrepreneurship or, sol or solutions? Yeah. Well, I would say the best, uh, most important learning for me is patience. Um, you know, our company, Schneider Electric, was uh, like 15 years ago, ago doing breakers. Is it sexy? Well, we were doing breakers. And 15 years ago, our CEO was saying, well, we want to be the best company in the world on sustainability. 15 years ago. Everybody is talking about sustainability right now, but it, 15 years ago, that was not the case. And you know, in, in terms of investors' relationship, people were asking, well, will you deliver money? You're talking about sustainability, but still, workers and money, will it flow, or what's the deal? So I mean, you face numbers of questions like that, but at the end of the day, it's, it was a huge transformation. And to do that, you need to embark the whole organization. It just, it's not just one CEO deciding, you need to embark everybody. So it takes time. And now we, are, we have been nominated the most sustainable company, and we have been repositioned uh, the company towards sustainability, software, services, etc. So it's not the same company at all, but because we embarked for 15 years. So at the end of the day, to be successful is the right to fail, but also it's a lot of patience in embarking people, not just one single person, but embarking the whole ecosystem to make it work. So that's it. Um, the conversation will continue over some refreshments uh, in here in this room. Uh, I want to say thank you to all the panelists. I want to pick up on what Eski said. Thank you for making uh, the trip to, to here from Midtown. From Midtown, and I also just want to say thank you so much to AB Inbev who made this session possible. So thank you so much. Thank you.